microphone is open, so if you want to ask questions, just go ahead. Okay. We're going to discuss about pulmonary function testing tonight. Lung volumes during inspiration and expiration. Now, the specific volume in the lung really varies a lot due to the patient's size and their training. Athletes, particularly aerobic athletes who've trained for many years, will actually have a larger lung volume. Women usually have smaller lung volumes than men do due to the size of the thoracic cage. Height makes a difference, but also width makes a difference too. So the height of the patient gets you a little closer, but isn't the whole thing. It's more what is normal or abnormal for that particular patient, and normal values don't mean much. It's more when you compare different values that you can start seeing something. Ventilation is measured by computing the volume of inspired air and the oxygen content. The volume is determined through a spirogram. It's they're blowing into a device. The older ones had a bell that they would go up and down and make a mark on a chart. Newer ones give you digital output. They have to wear a nose clip and they have to breathe in through a mouthpiece, which is fairly claustrophobic. So you're not getting quite a good reading sometimes, particularly if a patient's at all claustrophobic. Normal values, a lot of the data was developed through PE programs at different universities. So a lot of the subjects in the studies were athletes, so it tends to be skewed high, just like met tables are skewed that way too. An athlete is more efficient and they're going to use less METs than somebody who's not very coordinated, things like that. Factors that control respiration is under the control of your autonomic nervous system. There's a couple things that it controls. The wanting to breathe to begin with, but you can volitionally control breathing too. Out of the vital signs, ventilation is the only thing you have any volitional control over. You really don't have volitional control over your heart rate. You don't really have volitional control over your blood pressure. But you do have some volitional control over breathing. You don't often think about it, so you don't often use that volitional control. You're more likely going to rely on the autonomic nervous system to do that. The autonomic nervous system, really the major nucleus of it resides within the hypothalamus of the brain in the midbrain area. It's going to get input from uh, various oxygen sensors. The stress level on the whole body is an input into it as well. Maybe coming up through more of the spinal thalamic tract because you're not always fully aware of that, although you are aware of some of it. Dorsal columns is also going to control that, but the autonomic is probably getting more input through the spinal thalamic than anything else. Hello, Steve. You've been waiting for this one. I have a little late, but... Okay. So the autonomic is a big control factor. Yet the autonomic projects to the vagus nucleus in the medulla, and then that will project out to something called the dorsal plexus, which is about T2 or so through about T6. Patients who have damage above T4 usually have a deficit in the functioning of that plexus. One thing you may want to do when you're evaluating a patient or assessing them is simply look, do they have a good vagus nerve? Is the vagus nucleus functioning? The easy thing to do is to check a gag reflex because that's sensed by the vagus. And if you, they don't have a good gag reflex, they really won't be able to control their ventilation terribly well. They won't be able to control their their heart rate or their blood pressure terribly well. Autonomic dysreflexia and things like that come from when that plexus is disrupted or the tracks going to the plexus. So in traumatic brain injury, it's more damage to the vagus nucleus up there because that's really close to the foramen magnum, gets really compressed and sometimes pushed out through there, so you have a lot of problems there. The other receptors that go into there is the bell receptors. Now, they're going to affect more the heart rate than the breathing, but they affect that. The hypothalamus really monitors several things. Your O2 saturation level in your blood. That's probably the primary factor. If the O2 saturation is chronically low, like with the COPD patient, then it looks at maybe the CO2 level or the pH. And 
if the CO2 is too high, they'll breathe more. Also, if the pH is too low, they're too acidotic, they'll start to breathe more. There's actually three breathing patterns that you see related to this, and they're apneustic patterns. So they actually stop breathing. That's what apneustic means. And then when something triggers enough, they'll start to breathe for a while until that trigger is reduced. Severe heart failure causes less pressure on the bell receptors in the carotid artery in the carotid sinus. That's going to stimulate what's called a chain stokes breathing. And they'll take a small breath, a deeper breath, a deeper breath, a deeper breath, and then as deep as they can and continue that for a while until the pH has elevated enough and then they'll stop breathing and then the pH will gradually start to lower due to body metabolism and they'll trigger again so they may stop breathing for 30 seconds a minute that's called a chain stokes so it's got that rising sort of leveling off and then just stopping I have seen some books which had to rise up and then slowly go back down again stair step back down again I've never seen a patient do that and I've seen many go through chain stokes they usually just raise up the pH enough and then stop. I think pH may be the bigger drive if O2 saturation isn't working. And patients with chronic heart failure, they get onto that hypoxic drive too, which is either the CO2 level or the pH, because CO2 is an acid, it will lower the pH level. So which one it is is questionable. I think there's stronger evidence pointing to the pH as being the real factor there. There's Boyd's, which you see with traumatic brain injury, when the third ventricle swells up a lot, with hydrocephalus, which is typical response to the traumatic brain injury. It'll put pressure on this area and make the brain not function very well and make the hypothalamus not function very well. And you see a very, they'll stop breathing, the pH will trigger them to breathe again, and you'll see a very uncontrolled pattern in breathing. Some breaths will be deep, some will be shallow, some will be very close together, some will be very spread apart. It looks like ventricular fibrillation on a spirometer if you'd had it graphed out. And then once they raise the pH enough, they stop breathing again. Or once the CO2 level is lowered enough, they'll stop breathing. There's Kuzmol, which you usually see in a patient who's in a diabetic coma, which uh, with severe hyperglycemia. There, they'll stop breathing, and then they'll go to gasping breaths, full inspiration, expiration for a while, and then again, the pH gets high enough that they don't breathe, or the CO2 level gets low enough, or maybe their oxygen gets high enough. Oxygen is the base, and that raises the pH. We don't really know for sure which one it is. T to change your pH the fastest, breathing does it the fastest. So respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis can change relatively quickly. and has to do with breathing in more, increasing your ventilations, both the depth and the frequency. The sympathetic stimulation is going to cause you to breathe more, but it's also going to cause constriction of the airways. Parasympathetic may slow down the rate of breathing, but also dilates the airways more. Now, sympathetic will increase the heart rate. It'll also increase the force of contraction of the heart, but it's going to cause vasoconstriction as well. And parasympathetic is the opposite of that. Decrease of the heart rate, decrease of the force of contraction. So your systolic pressure will start dropping in relationship to the diastolic, and the pulse pressure will narrow more. If the diastolic rate rises, with which it does when you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, that's going to increase the resistance on the heart. That will also lower the systolic as a result of that because of the increased peripheral resistance. But the heart rate will go up. So you see an increase in heart rate. The heart will try to contract with more force, thus really stressing the heart muscle quite a bit the myocardium, but they won't necessarily change the oxygenation out of the body that much because the diastolic is going up, increasing that resistance. You sort of have to understand this play or interplay with the autonomic nervous system and your vital signs. 
spirometry is a way to get a, an objective measure of what's going on. I can see somebody's breathing deeper by just observing them. Better yet, I can palpate diaphragm, I can palpate in between the ribs for the intercostals, and I can palpate the accessory muscles as well, just to show how much effort somebody's putting out. Now that effort can also be subjectively determined through the Borg or the RPE scale. But spirometry gives me that objective measure of the volume. You can also see the rate pretty easily, particularly if you graph it out. You can calculate the rate as well. The digital displays don't necessarily give you the rate all that well or most of the ones I've played with. They just give you the volume, but they don't give you the rate. Tidal volume is normal breathing in and out. And for somebody to have either restrictive or obstructive pulmonary disease, tidal volume needs to be reduced. Samantha, I'm going to delete you because I'm getting a lot of clicking and noise in the background. The patient, really, if it's normal, they shouldn't be in any sort of respiratory distress at all. And that actual volume is dependent upon the size of the patient. During regular tidal breathing, really all we're using is the diaphragm. We're not kicking in any of the accessory muscles normally. And contracts the diaphragm causes inspiration. Relaxation of the diaphragm causes expiration. The inspiratory volumes, they are reduced in restrictive disease, and clinically this actually may be more important to a level but generally it's more important to the viability of the patient. If you start seeing these really drop, the patient's not getting any air in, they're not gonna survive very long. They're going into ventilatory failure, and you can have a chronic and acute. The chronic we think of more is the restrictive disease process. Usually what's causing this is deficits in and around the rib cage, if preventing it from expanding, rib fractures, sternal fractures, it hurts to expand the lungs. And what happens when you inspire is the rib cage actually expands. The volume in the pleural space gets larger. That pulls on the lung tissue and that sucks air in to fill it. There's a negative pressure developed between the lung tissue and the rib cage itself of the inner thoracic space. So that's why problems there. Mobility of the rib cage too, things like problems in the costal vertebral joints, thoracic kyphosis and a kyphotic posture decreases the ability to inspire. Pain of the costal cartilages like costal chondritis can also do that, and there can be de decreased mobility of the lung tissue itself. Usually you see that with more the obstructive diseases causing that, and then once the lung tissue can expand, then you can't get more air in. So obstructive disease can down the road cause a restrictive disease as well. Pneumonia, when you're all congested in a lobe, that lobe does not expand and contract. Thus, if the lungs don't expand, you see decrease in inspiratory volumes. Actually, pneumonia is, at least in the consolidation phases of it, is considered to be restrictive disease. And that's a good example of that. But advanced COPD, where the basal lobes are all full of gunk, Silicosis, where you have a lot of fibrotic tissue in there, preventing the lungs from expanding. Those are going to be restrictive due to the lung tissue itself. Doesn't really care how far the rib cage widens and the inner thoracic space enlargens. If the lungs aren't elastic enough to spread out, you don't have much inspiration. You have two values here, the inspiratory reverb, reserve volume and the inspire uh, capacity. Inspiratory reserve volume, to get this measure, you have a patient suck in as much air as possible. Try to do a maximal inhalation. You have them do a maximal inhalation for you. Inspiratory reserve capacity is something you calculate from that inspiratory reserve volume, and then you add tidal volume to it. So you sort of do this test, but then you can make this calculation as well. Expiratory volumes means you can't get the air out. One of the big things is you see an increase in residual volume. That's the amount of air we cannot normally expire. If you hear somebody got their wind knocked out of them, what they did was lose some of that residual volume. You need that residual volume to prevent the lungs from collapsing down and collapsing too far. 
you can get the wind out of you a little bit and you can with some breathing over a minute or so maybe two to three minutes you can usually regain that but if you collapse them down too far air may have entered the pleural space and that prevents the lung from expanding again that's called atelectasis that would also happen if the lung tissue actually sort of pops and the lungs will collapse as a result of that, at least that lobe will. And again, a lot of the air escapes into the pleural space, which really should be devoid of air. That prevents that negative pressure from having any effect, and you really need to insert a chest tube to withdraw that air. And gradually, as they breathe, the lung tissue will heal, and it'll seal and then start to re-expand and force the air out of the pleural space if the chest tube is there for that air that's trapped to exit. That's called a pneumothorax at that point if there's air in the pleural space and they do have a chest tube that you lay them with the involved side up to allow that air to escape easier. It usually there's a tube, the chest tube is connected to a long tube that goes to a water trap, usually about four to six inches off the floor. The air, when they inspire and the air comes out of the pleural space, it'll bubble down through and go out to the atmosphere. But then when they, when they expire, the air can't come back in again because you got the water trap. It maybe will pull a little bit of water up the tube for maybe six inches or so, maybe a foot, but it won't be able to get into the chest cavity. It would have too far to go to do that. You don't have enough force to be able to get that water siphoned up in the chest cavity. So that's how the water trap thing works with the chest tube. Residual volume is determined by gas dilution. In other words, you give them a known quantity of a gas that isn't usually present, and then you have them breathe it for about three to four minutes, and then you measure how much of that gas was absorbed. That gives you an idea of how much residual space is there. That allows you to calculate that. Small quantities of carbon monoxide are used for that. There are some other gases too that could be used, but that's how you calculate that residual volume. It's not something you would probably do that once and then keep using that marker. You may not want to come back and repeat that very often. The expired reserve volume is the maximum amount the patient can exhale after a maximal inhalation. That one you could repeat fairly frequently if you want to monitor improvement or lack of improvement in a patient or the effectiveness of your treatment. The functional reserve capacity is the total amount of air available for expiration, which is the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume. That's why when they, when they first do pulmonary function testing, they'll probably do a test with the residual volume, thus they can use that to calculate a bunch of things. The muscles that are used to, to force expiration are the abdominal muscles, primarily the obliques the internal, the external, and the transverse because they enclose the whole abdomen. The rectus abdominis just down the center doesn't really add much to it. The oblique muscles have a high percentage of type 1 muscle fiber or the aerobic fibers, so they're more able to be used for longer periods of time. The rectus abdominis is more an anaerobic muscle fiber or have a high percentage of anaerobic fibers. It's meant to add a little bit extra force to things like trunk flexion and things like that. It's not necessarily that much involved in balance either. It's more the obliques as well. Tidal expiration is just relaxation of the diaphragm. Vital capacity is the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. So you can calculate these from the spirometer values you've already achieved. Maximal voluntary ventilation is you ask the patient to breathe really fast. Use a spirometer to measure how much air they can breathe out during a minute. It's really decreased in both restrictive and obstructive pulmonary disease. The forced expiratory volume, usually the FEV1 is the one that's used the most, and it's the amount of air after a full inspiration that they can expire within one second. In obstructive pulmonary disease, they can take in a fair amount of air because inspiration is not really restricted, but they cannot get the air back out again. And they can only really expire a small percentage in one second 
of the air they took in. And FEV2 is how much within two seconds. Well, that's not used a lot. This test is used somewhat to denote obstructive disease. It also really can show the effect of a rescue inhaler. Rescue inhalers should activate really quickly. Usually they take a couple puffs and if they did some personal breathing, it would help it even more. And then you do this test after about a minute or so because that drug should be starting to take effect. The effect of a rescue inhaler will probably wear off within five minutes. It'll be totally, you probably won't have the effect of the drug anymore. The drug is usually atropine or something like that and that speeds things up. They also would have an increased heart rate. They would have an increased force of contraction of the heart. So you'd see the systolic blood pressure go up with the diastolic remaining relatively normal. The pulse pressure would increase. Oxygenation would be better throughout the body. They'll also, it'll stimulate the whole nervous system to some extent, and you will see patients have an increased number of motor unit recruitment and things like that, so their strength would actually increase for that short period of time when the drug is active as well. Athletic unions have looked at this issue and really what they've come out and decided is a patient could not use a rescue inhaler for five minutes before they actually perform their sport. So like a weightlifter, they can't take some hits off their rescue inhaler and then go out and lift right away because in that case, they can probably lift another 10 pounds or so because they're recruiting more motor units. And they can also damage themselves pretty easily by doing that too. Usually, no matter how hard we try, we can only recruit about 70 to 80 percent of our motor units. If you take a hit with a rescue inhaler, you can probably get 90, 95 percent recruitment, which would really increase your strength, but really get the point of overusing the muscles as well, maybe causing muscle tears. You're definitely loading up the skeletal system more than the patient was used to or the athlete was used to and cause uh, joint problems as well. Total lung capacity is the total volume of air that enters and exits the lungs. That is inspiratory capacity plus the vital capacity and the reserve volume. In patients with chronic COPD with cystic fibrosis and particularly cystic fibrosis, there becomes a lot of airspace that they cannot use, like the basal lobes and lungs, even the middle lobes and lungs become very congested with sputum they can't get out and they can't get air out either. The lungs start to try to increase their volume to get more oxygen into the patient. In so doing, they enlarge the chest cavity. The chest cavity gets larger. That's called the barrel chest. So somebody with chronic COPD, somebody with moderate to late stage cystic fibrosis, you'll actually see the barrel chest start forming and the total lung capacity will go up in those patients. Lung disease classifications are either the restrictive or obstructive pulmonary disease patterns. And you will have questions on the exam over these patterns. And certain of the values are increased, certain are decreased. In each of them, you really need to understand which ones would be increased and decreased. And if you sort of understand it, you'll be able to figure out which ones they're talking about when they give them as the answer choices. And usually the answer choices have like four factors each. And probably one would be they'd probably give you an answer choice that's more obstructive pattern. Another one, they give you more of the restrictive pattern. Another one, they'll probably mix them up for the other two answer choices, where it'll be some factors that are increased and some that should be decreased to get two wrong answers out of it. Basically, in obstructive, you see that increase in residual volume. That's the big thing you see. And then everything that residual volume is related to would be increased as well. Restrictive lung disease, you see a decrease in the inspiratory capacity. In both cases, tidal volume will be decreased. Because if tidal volume is normal or increased, they do not have pulmonary disease of a significant level. You need to be able to auscultate the lungs. Having a stethoscope with you is part of normal practice. And I think the lung auscultation will be probably more common than even the cardiac auscultation. In practice, unless I'm looking for a valve problem, the Kentucky and those type of patterns are fairly hard to actually hear sometimes. You can hear a more 
stenosis called a thrill. You can hear more of a lower frequency regurgitation type thing in somebody with a valve that's incompetent and leaking. Those are the typical murmurs you hear, and I think that's probably used clinically more often. There's better tests for heart failure. There's better tests for other things. It's not a great monitoring test because the sounds don't change all that easily. With a cardiac patient with heart failure, the main thing I'm going to be listening for is a lung for pulmonary edema. You want to get them sitting up, you're listening for rails, sometimes called crackles, over the base or lobes. And they're usually called coarse rails because they really have a popping sound to them. They sort of sound like Rice Krispies when you throw the milk on, on the snap, crackle, pop. It's a good way to remember it. With heart failure, that's probably the number one thing I'm looking for. I may check out the valves because valve problems can cause heart failure. But generally in heart auscultation, it's more that. With the lungs, we can determine which lobe is involved. We can listen for rails. We can listen for ronchi, which is sputum. And you hear the sputum go glup going up and glup going down. As they inspire, it'll go down. As they expire, it'll, go up. it'll start to go up. If it's really thick, it really can't go very far. It can't get expelled usually because it's too thick to. Like a cystic fibrosis patient, it's very uh, tenacious. Sometimes with COPD, you'll, you'll see that too, or you'll hear that as well. Particularly a COPD patient that's relatively dehydrated. Hydration helps a lot. And actually for cystic fibrosis, hydration is one of the things that would help, but humidified air will start to thin out the sputum. It'll get into solution more, then they can expel it easier. Early on, you're probably, when they're fairly strong, you probably can have them do coughing and huffing. Later, you're probably going to have to do pulmonary drainage on them as the, mu the accessory muscles of expiration become really weak. Because the abdominals are too weak, you really can't use them. They can't use them effectively. You need to be able to auscultate the different lobes. So you need to know where they are anatomically. The basal lobes are in the back. The apical lobes are at the top, but you only hear them in the front, like the midclavicular area. Middle lobes are in between. On the left side, the middle lobe is small, and they actually have the name for it is called the lingular lobe. They like to throw that on the exam, this just on the left side. Uh, the left lung actually is smaller than the right lung because a lot of the space of the left lung is taken up with the heart, particularly the middle of the lung is. Basal lobes are relatively equal. It's that middle area where the heart's taking a lot of the space. So it's going to affect the middle lobes and a little bit of the upper lobe, not the apical. Apical would be unaffected by that as well and your right apical and your left apical, relatively the same size. Baser lobes are relatively the same size on, size on both sides as well. If you're listening for a lot of accumulation of garbage in the lungs, like sputum and things like that that they can't get up, it's most likely going to be in the baser lobe. Fluid and edema is going to fall down that baser lobe as well. So we're oscitating that lobe probably most commonly. When I start oscitating somebody's lungs, I restart in the baser lobe because that's more likely where a problem would be found. Some pneumonias are, it depends on the bacteria causing it, are very aerobic in nature. The bacteria is, they'll be actually more in the apical lobes because there's better ventilation in the apical lobes than there is the basilar lobes. Basilar lobes have the worst ventilation of all the lobes of the lungs. But you need to look at the locations and sort of know where they are. You also need to know where the trachea is and the main stem bronchus and the bronchioles. I sort of have a little picture here. Trachea coming down and then spreading out into the main stem bronchus, the right and the left, and the bronchioles go to the different lobes. Also the area of the lung. Tracheal is centrally located. Bronchial is just a little ways out from that, both on the right and left side. So if you put like a target over somebody's chest, the center of the target is going to be tracheal. The next ring out is going to be bronchial. The next ring out is going to be bronchial or vascular, which is a lot of the bronchioles and way out is going to be vascular, which you're really listening to more the alveoli than anything else at that point. So just think of a target over somebody's chest. 
the sounds you listen for. Sometimes you can have them say A, and you hear an A sound when you ask the patient to say E instead. This indicates consolidated lung tissue underneath that and that particular lobe. If you're looking for pneumonia, you may want to be finding out which lobe is involved so you can position them properly to do pulmonary drainage. You can see which lobe you want to percuss over the most or vibrate over the most, things like that. So you need to know that location. Bronchophony has been on the exam before. All these have been on the exam. And you're listening to them as you're having them say these things. A positive bronchophony would indicate partial occlu occlusion of the bronchus or the bronchioles. You see it with bronchitis a lot. Now, bronchitis, we have both chronic and acute. Acute bronchitis is due to infection. If a patient has repeated uh, acute bronchitis, it can damage the walls in there, the bronchioles or the bronchus, and you hear this all the time when they're not sick. With acute, you'd hear it only when they're not feeling very good, they're running a temp, a bunch of things like that. It could be a viral infection. It could be a um, bacterial infection that causes it. Usually with pneumonia, the lung gets so consolidated in a particular lobe or lobes that you really can't hear breath exchange. You couldn't hear sounds being transmitted in that area. You can't see, hear them when they whisper one, two, or three, and that's Maybe a better way or something I do along with listening for breath sounds, but when they're really consolidated, you don't get this and you don't get breath sounds in the area. Wheezes are high-pitched. They're usually due to a narrowing of the airway. They can be sort of squeaky. They're typically an asthma if somebody's having an asthmatic attack or has chronic asthma. You will have it in over some of the lobes, usually not all the lobes, but some of the lobes. An acute asthmatic attack, probably all the lobes, but your time is probably best spent trying to calm the patient down, getting a rescue inhaler, getting a few puffs there, having them purse breathe, then worrying about assessing the situation. Bronchi are low-pitched sort of like a snoring sound. It's from a large collection of sputum in there, partially obstructing an airway. It could be from aspirated material, if you think they may have aspirated. This is going to be more bronchial or tracheal in nature. This is going to be more in the bronchioles and even in the alveoli area or that vascular area. I can't see them writing an exam where they aren't having you listen for rails, or crepitation or crackles. I can't see them not having that on there. And it's pulmonary edema. If the lungs collapse, the slight part of that lung that's not collapsed will get fairly inflamed and that'll give you the edema there. More of a fine rails or fine crackles instead of coarse. Pulmonary edema itself, like from heart failure, usually more coarse. Different breathing patterns. If they have a decrease in lung volume, you get a shallow breathing. It can be rapid and shallow or it can be slow and shallow. Tachypenia means rapid. Bradypenia means slow. Apnea means they're not breathing at all. And we went through these breathing patterns. Paradoxical is usually when the heart is so weak. Or you can also see a paradoxical breathing is where the rib cage is disrupted. And it's usually some reference sources say three ribs, some say four, some say five ribs are fractured, uh, consecutive ribs in really about the same area. So that you see that side of the chest wall when they try to inspire, that part of the chest wall caves in during inspiration. Bouchard's has been on the exam before. Asthmatic breathing, the real thing with asthma is you hear the, the wheezing, and most time with severe asthmatic attack, you don't even discuss a stethoscope to hear the, the wheezing sound. The frog breathing in gloss and pharyngeal is actually pretty much the same thing, but frog breathing is what the patient does on their own. Gloss and pharyngeal is a technique that you teach them to do. That's really where the different lie the difference lies between those. What it's doing is using your muscles of swallowing to force more air down the airway to increase your ventilatory support. A C4, I'm going to teach them to do glossopharyngeal breathing, maybe even a C5. That increases their breath support, which means their voice would be louder. And maybe I could hear what they're trying to say. It'd be loud enough to really vibrate the vocal cords well and project that sound out. 
if you don't have much air going in, you don't get a lot of sound coming out. The physiological dead space is more an area of the lung that has perfusion to it. In other words, the blood's not getting in there to go through. You get a lot of physiological dead space after somebody has a pulmonary embolus, for instance. It's a good example. Arterial blood gases may show up on the exam. Blood is actually withdrawn from an artery. The sample's taken from an artery, usually the radial is analyzed usually for pH, PO2, PCO2, and HCO3. And you probably have to know the normal values of these. And they will show up on the exam. They're a range which is considered normal. Uh, it can be low, it can be high. Bicarbonate is not really something coming from the air so much. It is something produced by the body or Sometimes you give a patient sodium bicarbonate if they're too acidotic and it's a base in there. That's why that pH is relatively important because pH is the reflects how acidotic, how much acid is there, or how much alkali is there. CO2 is an acid, O2 is a relative base. Oxygen saturation level, that's usually done not so much from the art, uh, from the, the atrial blood gases, but it's more computed by a pulse oximeter reading. And we use that a lot to monitor patients because you can leave a pulse oximeter on them all the time. For arterial blood gases, they do a cut down, which is a surgical procedure to dissect out the artery, then they draw the blood directly out of the artery. They really can't come back and hit that artery again for at least 72 hours, if not more. So they cannot pull arterial blood gases very often. It's sometimes done in a very critical patient one time and they do that and they do a pulse oximetry reading at the same time they pull the blood and then they compare the two and that sort of normalizes your pulse oximeter and they can make it more accurate that way. Things like atherosclerotic disease and things like that can decrease your peripheral arterial supply. That'll lower your O2 saturation level reading, make it abnormally low and if they did an ABG at the same time they could sort of normalize it that you know it's running maybe 5% or 10% lower than it should be. Geriatric patients, that is a problem because they usually have fairly significant atherosclerotic disease. You could not use arterial blood gases to monitor a patient because you don't have that many arteries to dissect, take samples. Also, they go to the lab, things like that. So an hour, two or th three hours later, you get the results back you don't get it instantaneously. Pulse oximetry, you get the reading in real time, basically. Like an emphysema patient, you're usually dealing with an older patient with emphysema. They may also have fairly significant atherosclerotic disease going on. This can determine how much of which one it is. Very critical patients, the ABGs are, are used. Actually, the Borg scale was normed on PaO2 and PaCO2 levels. Poisoning like aspirin, acute alcohol, things like that, you'll see abnormal bicarbonate levels. Severe diarrhea can cause it as well because you're losing a lot of base, liver disease. I would say pancreatic disease as well. Shock. The high bicarbonate, this is a high base level, and the patient's going into respiratory acidosis due to the emphysema. It can really show where you are. Large amounts of black licorice is not exactly the greatest thing for you in the world. Um, baking soda or antacids, taking abnormally large amounts of them, because these are slightly bases as well, and bases will increase the HCO3 level, or the bicarbonate level within the body. I think you have more questions over oxygen saturation, and they'll probably give you the reading more. If they give you detail, they may throw that into a detail in the question. You're more likely to see that one, because we use it all the time, and it's something you used to monitor a patient. O2 sat is really a fourth vital sign. That's probably the best way to say it uh, in the clinic. Textbooks sometimes haven't reflected all that always because pulse oximeters used to be ungodly expensive. Now the prices have come down where they're really not. They're 
as much as a good stethoscope, they're as much as a good blood pressure, very accurate blood pressure cuff would be. So the prices have come down with that into the price of normal tools we use. They're available in the clinic. A pulse oximeter is usually available to you in a lot of clinical situations. Maybe outpatient ortho, not so much, but other ones, yes. I have even used them for outpatient ortho because if you're looking for a thoracic outlet syndrome where you would feel the pulse get weaker, you would also see the O2 sat drop in the hand. So that might be easier to look for than keeping your fingers always on that radial artery. Doing Allen's test of the hand, you can occlude the radial artery with your thing, you can look for the skin color to turn a little bit more cyanotic, or earlier than that, you'd probably see the O2 sat level starting to drop if you have a pulse oximeter hooked up to their index finger. Now, you wouldn't want to have an ear clip on them and do that. You'd want to be recording out off their, their finger instead of the hand that I'm testing. Same thing for the thoracic outlet syndrome. The signs and symptoms of respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. And really, metabolic acidosis and alkalosis are pretty similar signs and symptoms as well. The pH does change, and that may be one of the things causing it. Respiratory abnormalities can be corrected by the depth and the frequency of breathing fairly easily. If a patient can't do it themselves, they could use a ventilator. The other thing to look at is the sputum, and sputum is sort of like the drainage from a wound because it's a lung draining. And the inside of the lung is sort of similar to the skin. The villi are similar to that capillary bed on the very top of the dermis. Fetid is foul smelling. It's usually associated with sputum that's been sitting around for a while and starting to ferment. So that fermentation process is where the smell's coming from. Anaerobic infections, bronchiectasis, lung abscesses where it's contained and then breaks free, and cystic fibrosis where they can't get the sputum up is sitting there and starting to break down and starting to ferment. That's going to give you a really nasty smell. Frothy is primarily pulmonary edema. Most of the time you see it as a foamy white type thing. After they spit it out, it sits there for a minute, the bubbles will start to pop, and it'll start to just look like plain fluid. But initially, when they spit it out, it'll be very frothy and full of little air bubbles that reflects light and tends to look sort of whitish, usually what you see. It can be brown or pink tinged. If there's a lot of pressure coming in from blood side of the alveoli, pushing a lot of pressure through, some of the blood vessels, those capillary around the alveoli will actually rupture. Red blood cells will go in there. If it had been there for a while, that blood will oxidize and be more of a brown color. If it's coming right away and then they're coughing it up, it's going to be maybe a pink and bloody colored. And after you let the bubbles all go away, you can see blood streaks in something with a pink tinged one or just brownish flecks and things like that with a little bit more chronic situation and usually coming from a little bit deeper in the lungs. Whenever you see a frothy, the lungs have to be about a third to two-thirds full of fluid. Patients aren't going to survive at that level. Usually you see this right before somebody expires of heart failure or COPD because the lungs are really severely damaged. They're not getting enough oxygen to the other body tissues. Homoptysis is blood. It looks like blood. It's sort of the thicker type thing. It's usually caused from the major airways, bleeding the capillaries there. That's where the blood's coming from. If a patient's having a lot of bronchial spasms, they'll have that. They're coughing really deeply and a lot. They'll rupture some of the capillaries in the airways. Sometimes noxious gases and things like that will rupture things. It's usually coming from the major airways. In that respect, the lung tissue itself may not be all that damaged, but you got to stop the coughing and things like that because they will scar the, the bronchus and things like that as well. Mucoid, white, sort of clear, milky color to it. It's really white blood cells. Sometimes you see it with some chronic irritation in there, like cystic fibrosis, things like that. It's a good sign of TB. 
they have this type of drainage as well because the Duberkin bacillus really is sort of like a spore. It's got a shell around it and the immune system can't has a very difficult time getting through that getting through that shell to actually degrade the bacteria itself. But it acts like an irritant in the lung. And that irritant is going to cause an inflammatory response, taking more white blood cells to the area. So a mucoid drainage is fairly suspicious of TB, but you also see it in chronic bronchitis and cystic fibrosis. There's a chronic irritation there. After an asthmatic attack, you're going to see a lot of mucoid type sputum come out because there's a big inflammatory response in the lung and in the airways. And that'll produce a lot of, that'll draw a lot of white blood cells, which produces this mucoid drainage. Mucopurulent is colored. It's still opaque, pretty much. More of a pus is a good example of mucoid drainage. It's the milkiness is from the white blood cells, but there's also necrotic material, dead bacteria, things like that, that the white blood cells are removing. You really sort of want to see mucopurulent because it means the immune system is actually having a positive effect. Purulent is yellow, green, often copious and thick. It's more clear, not so milky. And there, that means white blood cells are not responding well to the area. Somebody with a deficient immune system would have something like that. Rusty is dead cells coming out. It sort of looks like prune juice. It can be thin, it can be thick, just depending on how many cells are actually being expelled. After pneumonia, you start seeing that because there's lung damage due to the pneumonia. Tenacious means thick and, and sticky. You see it with cystic fibrosis is a good example. Dehydration, things like that can thicken up that sputum as well. And sticky, they can't really expel it. Okay, did this help you at all? Yes. I opened it up. Steve, did this give you what you wanted? It was perfect. Yes, thank you. You've been asking for this one. Yeah. Funny thing, I was going over some uh, questions as uh, uh, the other day, and I couldn't answer one question with taking this uh, lecture. I was able to answer it pretty easy. I mean, I, I got my answer. Okay, I covered it. Yeah, you covered it. It was awesome. A lot of the times, it's, as you found out in the exam, it's more the understanding of things. I don't yeah. think doing a lot of questions really develops that understanding very well. Uh, it, no, because that's how I was studying before, and, and that, didn't, that didn't really help me. I mean, just listening to and understanding exactly, like you say, that's that's what really helped me with passing. Yep. Have you started work yet? Uh, no, I should be getting my license soon. The paperwork is in, so okay. soon enough. They usually turn those around fairly rapidly, and to be honest with you, your boss could call or actually even look at the state licensure website, mm -hmm. and your license number would be there. And okay. that'll show up even a couple weeks before you actually get the license physically in the mail. Yeah, uh, what they said is as soon as um, they get the, the check, mm -hmm. you know, they'll send it out. So the paperwork mm -hmm. is uh, in the mail. Yeah. So it's a matter of me filling it out and sending it out. Yeah, pop in your name and your social security number in uh, the state website that looks for licensed therapists. Mm -hmm. It'll show up there probably a week or so before you will actually receive it maybe in two weeks. Okay. And most employers, as long as they can access it, they have your license number that way. Yeah. They usually will start you. Okay. Good to know. Okay. Quick question. I have a, I do have a question. Um, I have a, a client that I'm not that has a friend that has POTS, uh, the postural osteotic called. Hold on one second. You know the POTS? I'm not uh, po sure of that abbreviation. orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Okay. It means that when they're in upright posture, they tend to have more tachycardia with it, which means the heart is not increasing the volume enough or increasing the force of contractions enough. It's trying to increase the heart rate to compensate for that, but the force of contractions are not increasing the way they normally should, which really uh, you see when the heart muscle is damaged significantly. 
Yes. Not much you can do about that short of a heart transplant. It depends how severe it is. Right. I haven't asked him any questions, and I'm actually reading on that, these are symptoms. And it, he looks like more like a liability if I were to take him as a client. But I'm just, so, I'm just curious of what's... A client for what? Actually, this, is, this would be not for massage, but for um, training. So to get him a physical training and stuff? Physical, yes. I really... I would like to see clearance from a cardiologist on that. Okay, I'll ask for that. that that's probably the way to do it, and the cardiologist is probably going to say no. <laughs> because really exercise is going to have, it's going to take a long time to actually strengthen the heart muscle itself, if it ever does strengthen, and the chances of overusing it and causing a heart attack are fairly high. Uh -huh. Right. If I would take them on, intensity level would be like 60% of maximal. So you really want to keep the intensity way low. I would really like to see results of an exercise stress test Justice, yeah. and things like that. I'm sure he's had them to actually diagnose this. Okay. Well, sometimes the dopamine stress test instead, that doesn't show the full effect. Anaerobic exercise, you can probably get away with but you'd like to give like a 10 minute break between each set and the sets being fairly low in repetitions okay. and you probably could fairly safely increase his there with he's likely to have syncope <laughs> particularly <laughs> uh, with postural changes yeah. <laughs> going from lying down to sitting up and things like that yeah and he's compensating by increasing the heart rate so you expect to see high resting heart rates and the heart rate really jumping up a lot more than normal. Probably he might be better at going through a cardiac rehab than going through personal training. I will advise, yeah. But that is sort of a heart attack waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Once I started reading about it, I said, "Yeah, I don't." I'm gonna ask yeah. you a bunch of questions, yeah. and and then uh, it just came. It fell today. It just text one of my clients just texted me today, so it it just it was perfect timing because I knew I was gonna attend your class and I was gonna ask you questions because I'm I don't know if I'm the best person to help him. Okay then. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're, You're welcome. Great. Okay, then. Have a good night, and there's another one on Friday. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then. Bye-bye.